Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Ah! Can you smell it, guys? England! Ah, Smells like armpits and defeat. How are we even here anyways? Isn't there like a travel ban or something? Um, the joke only works if you don't think about it. But if you think it smells here, <laughs> just wait till we get to London. We're the VIP guests for the Stateside Hosts Inclusion Troop Podcast Convention. That doesn't mean we can't take in some culture while we're here. You know, live a little. Besides, it's England, James. Sherrod Forest. Land of Robin Hood and his merry men. I've lived in England before. Everybody here knows that Robin Hood isn't real. He's like England's version of Paul Bunyan or something. Yeah, it's the whole racket designed to take in dumb tourists. Oh my god, fish and chips. Oh, I'd miss that. Nigel, they say that if you listen carefully, you can almost hear the spirits of Robin and his merry men devising a strategy to free the land from the tyranny of Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham. Shh. Listen. Oi, give me your money. No, <gasps> it worked. Oh, shit. All right, I don't want no trouble. Just hand over your money, and things won't need to get messy. Oh my god! It's Robin Hood! What? He's got the hood and everything! Oh, oh, you've picked us as... Oh, what's the British term? Marks! Well, I mean, it stands to reason he'd target us. We're successful podcasters. <gasps> Thompson, I do believe we've been made to stand and deliver. Well, we mustn't tarry, Nigel. What, so we're having a laugh now? Here you go, good sir. Another thrust against Prince John and the Sheriff. Oh, uh, well, thanks. I owe five American dollars and a vote NATO sticker. Goddamn Yankee. That's freedom currency. You're welcome. Bugger off. Oh my god, 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 oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, that was Robin Hood. I mean, that was totally Robin Hood. That was totally Robin Hood. That dude from all the movies. God, it's as good as I remember. What are you two yelling about over here? We met Robin Hood! What? Yeah! He had a hood and a knife, and he asked us for our money! We got to help him rob from the rich and give to the poor! No, stop with the accents. You got mugged. No, we did it. That was Robin... Ooh, that looks really good. Mmm, smells good, too. Yeah, now I'm hungry. Where did you get those? Over, over, over there, but... No, but... Let's focus on you two getting mugged. We will, we will. But first food. Nigel, to the food! <sighs> Three, two, one. Um, Josh? Can we borrow some money? Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. <laughs> and listeners, and welcome to another Outlaw episode of The Fire Pit. I'm Josh, bounty hunter named Kletso Tripped, and we're catapulting right over the wall from last week's episode onto this one. Moving right along to The Fire Pit Strikes Back, heading to 1980's The Empire Strikes Back. See where we got the name? 
But tonight, we need to dodge the sheriff's men and flee into the forest. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them to this one. Now, to tell us what we're watching and who we're watching, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a quick handoff to Tom. Tom, here you go. Well, thank you, Josh. Tom here, Sith name Darth Stupidious. And last week, we followed the ever-talented Sigourney Weaver from fighting ghosts with Bill Murray in Ghostbusters 2 to fighting aliens in Galaxy Quest alongside Alan Rickman, who we'll be taking tonight to another role he's famous for, the dastardly Sheriff of Nottingham in 1991's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, also starring Kevin Costner, Morgan Freeman, Christian Slater, and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Mastrantonio. Roll the R, Tom. Mastra- Mastrantonio. They're, wow. Yeah, I'm if she's Italian. listening to this, she's pissed. <laughs> the movie sees Kevin Costner fail at being British, but not bad at being Robin Hood. But to give us more of a rundown on the film tonight, I'll send things over, handover style, to Dan. Thank you, Tom. I'm Dan. Jedi name can't do it. And as mentioned, uh, tonight we're watching 1991's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Came out in 91 and started a string of period piece action adventure and, pardon the pun, swashbuckling movies, both uh, theatrically and on TV. Flashbacks, flashbacks, no! Uh, the movie Swashbuckle came out well before this film because that was a 70s film and this came out on June 14th, 1991. Has a running time of 143 minutes, so just a little north of two hours. Uh, a budget of uh, $48 million and a box office return of $390.5 million. So I'd say it made its money back. Yeah, that's a little bit of a box office success yeah this is 90s dollars too so yes this movie was huge uh which is weird because it actually has a rotten tomato score at least the critic score of 51 percent audience score of 72 so audiences really like this movie but critics are stupid they don't know what they're talking about so it's only 51 percent with you know i also always wondered about especially right because movies that came out before rotten tomatoes was a thing so it's like you pe- people are coming in and like they're you know, toming the uh, their reviews, be like, oh, I don't like this episode. I always kind of wondered how they do that. Because, like, do they go back through, like, old episodes of Siskel and Ebert at the movies and see which ones they gave thumbs up and thumbs down to, and then they apply that to a Rotten Tomatoes score for the critic? I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's like, or do they only take in new reviews, like, online? Because at one point I did do some reading about on how – uh to get your reviews on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. And it's like, you need X number of written reviews published online or something like that to be, have a, yeah. Before you can be considered or something like, yep. So it's, I I don't know. I I really don't know how they're going to do it with the older films. Yeah. And this does have an IMDB score of, uh, well, let's just round it up a seven out of 10 on IMDB. So is it a 6.9? It's a 6.9. I rounded it up. Nice. Nice. Yeah, hell yeah. Robin Hood's a 6.9, baby. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. This movie is uh, kind of well-regarded. Now, that is to say well-regarded in comparison to other Robin Hood films, which have been not great. I mean, like the, the 1930s Errol Flynn Robin Hood. Well, that's the one where you get the stereotypical depiction of Robin Hood in the green tights and the uh, that that whatever kind of cap that he wore in the movie with the feather in it. And mm-hmm. Very swashbucklery. Yeah, very swashbucklery kind of Robin Hood and his merry men. And, <laughs> you know, um, this one was definitely a more darker take on the character, a more realistic take on the character. Um, and then the movie, Robin Hood movies that came out after this one have not been well received. Uh, there was 2010 Robin Hood and there was a 2018 version of Robin Hood. Uh, the less said about either one of those, the better. So was tw- the 2018 one where they tried to treat it like a modern warfare sort of thing, only with bows and arrows? Yes. Yeah, it also had like it had like Jamie Fox and the guy from uh, Kingsman in it, and um, just was awful. 
it's bad. And then the, the other one, the 2010 one was just boring. It's actually about the same length as far as time with this one is. This, this one's 142, 143 minutes. The 2010 version is 144 minutes. So it's one minute longer and it feels like three hours longer. So, But you guys are missing like arguably either on par or some would consider better Robin Hood than Prince of Thieves, which we're talking about men in tights. We're men in tights, tights, tights. Yes. That was because that Robin Hood spoke with an English accent. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> which was actually one of the first times on big screen cinema that he had did really did speak because I don't think Errol Flynn really tried a British accent very much in his version. And Kevin Costner definitely tried a British accent until you can tell the, the point in the movie when the director said, it's okay, Kevin, this Robin Hood could be from California. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Well, there was, it's all right. I mean, t- I mean, technically you're, can you whitewash a British film? <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I'll get to, I'll talk about the accents here in a little bit when I get to my movie trivia because I actually did some stuff and I found out some interesting discussions about the various accents heard and not heard in this film, which has kind of added a little bit of a, uh, a like a huh to me, you know, it kind of made me like eh, I guess that makes sense. So I'll talk about that here in a minute. I would go ahead. <laughs> all right so okay fine i'll go ahead and talk about the accents um it's kind of funny this movie is actually about one of the biggest legends in england history outside of king arthur and almost the entire movie's principal cast is not english outside of alan rickman nick brimble he's the guy who plays little john in the movie and a few others but like the, almost the whole principal cast is not english kevin costner mary elizabeth mastertonio christian slater very much not british while Sean Connery, who has an uncredited cameo at the end of the movie, is British. Uh, Richard definitely would not be a proud Scotsman. So, (laughs) uh, but anyways, uh, but what I was talking about, the accents, none of the principal cast is English, but this is about an English folklore hero. It would be like if Superman was played by a Brit. I mean, hold on. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, okay, if Batman was played by a Brit. I mean, if Spider-Man was played by a Brit. Never mind. So... (laughs) I see what you did there. <laughs> right. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, whenever the doctor regenerates, he, he or she needs to be American next. Okay. It's only fair, guys. It's only fair. But to be honest, just a little bit of a history lesson. No one should be speaking English in this movie. Kevin Costner's California American accent is every bit as British as what he would actually be speaking in, in the actual 1100s when this movie takes place. They should be speaking Old English or Middle English, which would be almost completely incomprehensible to us, to yes. our speakers of modern English. And also, Robin in this movie is Anglo-Norman aristocracy. So he probably wouldn't even be speaking English, Old English, or Middle English, period. He'd probably be speaking French. <laughs> and King Richard himself didn't speak English at all. He lived and died never speaking English at all. He, well, what did he speak? He spoke French. Mon really? Dieu. Yeah. Richard the Lionheart did not speak English. He spoke French and Latin. That was it. Today I learned. Right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was kind of funny. Like, I, I just was going down this rabbit hole of history. And a lot of people were making fun of the accents in this movie. Like, you know, Kevin Costner doesn't really speak with a British accent. Um, no one told Christian Slater to stop. And his sometimes there, sometimes not there Cockney accent is absolutely hilarious. Um, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio tries. God love her, she tries. And honestly, I did not know until I was looking into the cast of this movie, the guy who plays Friar Tuck was not English at all. He's 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 from America. He's born in Massachusetts. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, he does a really good accent, though, as Friar Tuck in this movie. He's really, really good. So I thought that was funny. Um, but yeah, but nobody technically in this movie would be speaking English, at least if they were to be quote unquote authentic to history just like that one really uh what was that movie that we really like nigel that was very historically accurate um gods of egypt yes that's my favorite historical documentary ever right up there with abraham lincoln vampire hunter <laughs> yes because <laughs> those are based on real events <laughs> it, very much so i mean that's the untold history was. the untold history so speaking of the cast this Cast includes three Oscar winners, Kevin Costner, Morgan Freeman, and Sir Sean Connery, even though he's uncredited, and three Oscar nominees, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, Jack Wilde, and Brian Adams. So today I learned Alan Rickman had never been nominated for an Oscar or won one. No kidding. Mm -hmm. But he's good. He's so damn good. Yeah. We live in a timeline in a universe where 
Kevin Costner has an Oscar, <laughs> but Alan Rickman does not. <laughs> no disrespect to Kevin Costner. I really like Kevin Costner. I just oh, thought yeah. that was funny. Um, speaking of Superman played by a Brit, uh, fans of the movie uh, Man of Steel will notice that both his dads in that movie are Robin Hood. Kevin Costner plays Robin Hood in this film, and his Kryptonian father was played by Russell Crowe, who plays Robin Hood in the 2010 version. Nice. But no Carrie Elwes in there. Ah, Carrie Elwes is funny. He actually turned down the role of Robin Hood in this film because he thought the plot was too contrived. He then <laughs> goes on to do the comedy version of this movie a year or so later. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, to be fair, Mel Brooks is awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is one of the few versions of Robin Hood. No mention is made of Prince John anywhere in the film. He was the younger brother of Richard the Lionheart. John was the de facto ruler of England from 1190 to 1194 while Richard was fighting in the Third Crusade. However, John doesn't actually become king of England until Richard is killed in like 1199. But in most Robin Hood legends, with the exception of this one and one of the TV series is in England, the Sheriff of Nottingham was a loyal follower of John. He's actually like John's dragon. Mm -hmm. John's the big bad in most Robin hood legends. So this is one of the very few legends or one of the very few versions of the legend that makes no mention of Prince John or his connection to the sheriff. So the sheriff is just the all around big bad in this film. It kind of makes sense. It does streamline it a little bit. It's like, yeah, it does help the audience know that this is the good guy, Robin hood. This is the bad yeah. guy, sheriff, the sheriff mm -hmm. of Nottingham. So and it was the nineties. So people got confused easily back then. Yeah. Well, they also, I mean, I remember the old version of Robin Hood, both the Errol Flynn version and the Disney version. And you always did kind of wonder who was the bigger bad, the sheriff or, or Prince John. So this does streamline it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've only got, I promise this time I've only got two more things to say. Which means five more things. Which actually means three because I miscounted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there were toys for this movie, which is hilarious because this movie is definitely not for kids. The movie starts with some guy getting his arm cut off and it ends with a guy trying to rape a woman. So yay kids. But those toys were awesome though. They were awesome because they were remolds. Kenner was given the toy license for this and didn't hardly spend any money on new molds. All the molds for this were either old star Wars figures yeah. or superpowers collection figures. Like literally Robin Hood, and this is hilarious. Robin Hood's a repaint of Green Arrow. <laughs> nice. Oh my god! Little John is a repaint of Hawka or Hawkman and um, Batman. He has Hawkman's top and Batman's bottoms. Like that's that's the the mold, the molds they use. They were old superpowers collections. And the uh, Sherwood Forest playset was actually the Ewok Village released for the Return of the Jedi toys in 1983. So oh my they just God. Wow. slapped awesome. a fresh coat. Yeah, slapped a fresh coat of paint on it and called it a new soy. Now, shit, if you make bukus of money off of it. I mean, honestly, do you blame them for trying to get in on that? Not, Not really. really. I mean, the... Star Wars, if they still had like, especially because of the DC superpowers toys didn't sell that great at the time. So they still had those molds sitting around there and they lost money on that. And if they still had like a bunch of Ewok play sets that either didn't sell or they still had like access to the molds to make new ones. Well, Return of the Jedi is 1983. Those kids have grown up. They're not playing with toys anymore. They're not going to buy new toys of, of that stuff. But if you still got them, Make a Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Sherwood Forest playset, and now those kids can play with them. So yeah, it's not like you know. the movie people are going to care about accuracy of the toys. It's the nineties. No, no, and most of them won't even notice unless you had an older brother that had the Ewok playset, and then your mom and dad got you the Sherwood Forest playset for Christmas, and you really thought they regifted your brother's toys. So, mm -hmm. and then the last two things I have, I promise, the major love ballad in this song or in this movie, everything I do, I do it for you by Brian Adams holds the record for longest unbroken run at the top of the UK charts for 16 consecutive weeks. Jesus God, this song was everywhere. And it is one of known TV potty mouth chef, Gordon Ramsay's favorite songs. I don't see that. It's rumored to be the song he danced with his wife to at their wedding. If that's inaccurate and Gordon Ramsay's listening to this, I'm sorry, but you can yell at me because I think you're cool. He would probably enjoy it. He would. There, I, I'm, I'm, we would enjoy it. That'd be like, yes. Mm. I would love to listen to Dan getting chewed out by Gordon Ramsay. Oh, God. I would pay to have him chew me out. I want him to yell at me. I'm like, I've watched every episode of all of your shows. Please scream at me. 
but anyways, and the last bit is Alan Rickman, Kevin Costner, both turned down the parts or their respective parts three times until both were told they could put their own spin on the characters. Rickman in particular had a blast playing the evil sheriff. He was allowed to do whatever he wants in the role. And when we watch the movie, you will see that. Um, He actually won the 1992 BAFTA award for best supporting actor for this film. And his acceptance speech was, thank you. This will be a helpful reminder to me that subtlety isn't everything. (laughs) (laughs) Hilarious. I can't wait to watch this movie again after reading all this trivia. So yeah, but we'll get to expectations in a bit. Josh, I would like to know what was going on in the box office. Well, um, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised in a good way because Robin Hood Prince of Thieves, like we've said before, was released in summer of 1991. Now, sometimes I got to look back at these 90s release things and I got to be like, oh my God, remember how in Ghostbusters we were talking about how all of those movies were in the box office at the same time, Batman, Ghostbusters 2, and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Yeah, Mm -hmm. along with like Prince or Last Crusade and all that. Oh yeah, well, this is a similar situation. Like there's a lot of very popular 90s films in the box office, but- Robin Hood Prince of Thieves was at number one for two weeks. So um, it's opening week, the top five, it opened at number one. So it opened at number one. Number two was City Slickers. Number three was Backdraft. Number four, I'm not familiar with this one, was Jungle Fever. Number five, I hope you guys are sitting down. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Oh, I love that movie as a kid. Yeah. So did I. <laughs> yes, that was uh that was Christina Applegate, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was married with children, Christina Applegate. Yes. Ooh, yeah. But uh yes, I remember loving that movie as a kid. But other notables in the box office at this time was What About Bob at number six, Thelma and Louise at number eight, Home Alone at number ten, Dances with Wolves at twelve, Silence of the Lambs at thirteen. Ooh. Hudson Hawk, 14, Kickboxer 2, The Road Back at 15, and Kindergarten Cop at 16 on its 26th week of release. Today, I know a lot of those films. Yeah. And today I learned they had a sequel to Kickboxer. Huh. I learned that when we were talking about lists for potential lists for this movie or for this journey. And Josh said that he had a list that took us through Kickboxer 3. And I'm like, wait, they had a Kickboxer 2? Oh, that's right. Yeah. He's yeah, like, yeah, 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 there's like four of these. And I'm like, Today I learned. <laughs> yes, but uh, what's what I, I have to note that during its second week of release, one of my all-time favorite movies of the '90s, uh, and I know I've mentioned this a while back, but uh, The Rocketeer came out during its second week of release. So Rocketeer premiered at four, but it got dethroned, and you're never going to guess what movie dethroned it. Dethroned Robin Hood. Dethroned Robin Hood. Uh, 1991. It would have been June 28th, 91. I'll give you guys one quick guess. Uh, okay, what's the hint? Back to the Future 2. Um, it is a sequel. Batman Returns? No. Damn. The Naked no. Gun 2 and a half. The smell oh. oh! Yeah, yeah, I told you you wouldn't get it. But yeah, so it lost its number one slot to The Naked Gun 2 and a half, The Smell of Fear, on its third week of release. That's a good sequel too. That's a yeah. That's not that's not a bad film though. Yeah. But all in all, I mean, this there was a lot of big movies that came out in '91. Yeah. So I don't know. That's it's, it's crazy to look back at the box office in the mid '90s, and I'm like, I remember that one. I remember that one. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised. I just like looking at the box office movies. I like looking at the movies that came out, and you don't realize they all came out within this like four or five year span between 1988 and 1992. Mm-hmm. Like all of these movies that we all love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. I'm just kind of surprised. I remembered um, Men in Tights doing, well, staying number one in the box office longer. I'm surprised it fell that quick. Prince of Thieves? Yeah, yeah Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Did I, I said Men in Tights, didn't I? Well, it, uh, it was in the theaters from June to October. And it wasn't until its last two weeks of release it finally dropped out of the top ten. So it stayed in the top 10. Yeah. I mean, it made $390.5 million. Mm. So even if it was only number two or number one for two weeks, it was people were buying tickets to see this film for months. Yeah. It may have only stayed in the top five for uh, a month, but it stayed in the top 10 almost all but two weeks of its entire run. Wow. I do remember it being in the theaters for a long time because I remember like wanting this movie on tape. 
Like I wanted the deep VHS of this, but you have to wait till it's done with its theatrical run before you get them on VHS. And it like just barely made Christmas that yeah. year. But that's all I got for uh box office. I'm curious to know some more about the uh, metadata about this film. So I think that's Tom's uh, court. And yes, it is. Well, gentlemen, you want to get meta? Let's get meta. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I feel like Tagline. we could have had a better segue into that. We could have. I blame Tom. Do you, yeah, do you me wanna, too. Do you want to try it again? Give it a second chance? Um, no. All right. Carrying on. Tagline. For the good of all men. And the love of one woman, he fought to uphold justice by breaking the law. I remember that tagline. Yes. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, where nobleman crusader Robin of Loxley breaks out of a Jerusalem prison with the help of Moorish fellow prisoner Azim. Bless you. Not a chew, Morgan Friedman, as he travels back home to England. But upon arrival, he discovers his dead father in the ruins of his family estate, killed by the vicious Sheriff of Nottingham. Alan Rickman. Robin and Nazim join forces with outlaws Little John, played by Nick Brimble, and Will Scarlet, played by Christian Slater, to save the kingdom from the sheriff's villainy. As Nigel noted, this this the story of Robin Hood has been told so many times. And because it's uh, been made so many times, these films kind of do serve as an unintentional snapshot of the kind of blockbuster style that was popular at the time and the kind of big name actor type that was in Vogue. So we start, of course, with the Vogue lead man himself, Kevin Costner, playing Robin of Loxley, the American Mel Gibson, if you will. And it is ironic, me calling him American Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson was originally offered this role, but he turned it down. This movie, he was three years away from Waterworld killing his career. But here, he's three years away from Waterworld killing his career at this point. But here, he was absolutely the go-to in Hollywood for lead men at this point. He has that dual power of being a square-jawed hero type and a sort of everyday man protagonist that they liked in the late 80s, early 90s. Think Tom Hanks with Bud Light talent. With him uh, was Morgan Freeman playing Azim. You know him as God, and rightly so, because 30 years later, he is a more recognizable name than pretty much everyone in this movie, including the lead. Dark Knight Trilogy, Million Dollar Baby, Seven, the list goes on. As the love interest, Mary Elizabeth, and I'm not going to screw it up this time. Master Antonio. Way to steal my thunder, Nigel. Master Antonio, thank you, playing Maid Marian. She's mostly TV stuff now. Um, Limitless, The Punisher, Law and Order. She's... But she's got a range of roles she's done. Um, she was Lindsay in The Abyss. She was Gina in Scarface. One, the radio chick from A Perfect Storm, Linda. And she was also in The January Man with Alan Rickman playing the Lord of Snark himself, Sheriff of Nottingham. And he absolutely stole the show as the sheriff. Yeah, he does. Yes. And there's a little bit of that, which I'm going to get to in a bit. Uh, in fact, it's nowadays you can't think of Robin not having a rivalry with the sheriff. In fact, more to the point, you kind of forget that uh, Robin Hood's supposed to be the star of this movie. Now, in the last episode, we did uh, bring up that Rickman was tired of being typecast at the villain. But God damn it, it's his fault for being so damn good at this. He's been Hans Gruber in Die Hard, Elliot Marston in Quigley Down Under, and the unfaithful husband in Love Actually. So you got a pretty solid cast right there. And rounding out the cast, you have your side characters, Michael McShane, Friar Tuck. He's one of those, hey, I recognize that guy from that one movie, or I recognize that voice from that one cartoon, video game, anime. Character actor, he's been in Drop Dead Gorgeous, Office Space, Richie Rich, and he's voiced Vampire Hunter D, Princess Mononoke, Final Fantasy X. He's just one of those guys. It just gets around. Then there's Christian Slater as Will Scarlet, who actually was a name, which is surprising considering he's built his whole career around his Jack Nicholson impersonation. (laughs) Not wrong. (laughs) No. He doesn't do too many lead roles, surprisingly enough. He's tends to stick to ensembles, uh, True Romance, Mr. Robot, 
And of course, Brian Blessed as Lord Loxley. You have to say his name like that. That is the law. You will get tried and hung in England if you don't do it that way. They had to kill him early because there wouldn't have been any scenery left for anyone else otherwise. Rarely a lead, always a presence. Shakespearean. And most- They also almost killed him for real. I was yeah. going to get he into almost, that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. But yeah, I, I, I left that out of my trivia. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah, he almost died for this role. That's your cast going into this. The director, Kevin Reynolds. This is kind of his bread and butter, these films. Count of Monte Cristo, Waterworld, Tristan and Isidore. He loves period pieces, uh, distilled for modern audiences. He was great for this. Waterworld, obviously, he bit off more than he could chew. The writers, Penn Densham, ampersand John Watterson, or Watson, excuse me. Really not much to them, Uh Mostly TV work before this. Uh, they worked together on The Zoo Gang and a gnome named Norm, which would explain some of the stuff that comes up with the drama behind this film. Nigel noted that uh, Rickman and Costner kind of had in their contracts that they could uh, go ham with their roles, and they took it quite literally, much to the consternation of the director. Uh, there was a lot of headbutting between Costner and the director over his imperse- his uh, accent. Mm-hmm. Kevin wanted to do a British accent. The director said, no, stop, please, you're hurting us. And it also should be noted, much like in Galaxy Quest, Rickman's character and Alan's character had the drama of Alan's character cutting him out, tr- you know, editing him out of whole episodes. This actually happened between Rickman and Costner. Costner had one of his friends take over editing from the director's editor, literally locked him out of his own editing suite because Rickman was getting more presence and he didn't like that. The movie was about him, not Rickman. So they trimmed quite a bit stuff out um, it was so bad, in fact, that um, the director didn't even show up to the premiere. He's like, I'm done. Screw you guys. You've ruined my film. It's funny, though. That's actually a rumor that's unsubstantiated that Costner tried to edit Rickman out. He, the major falling out there was with the director, Kevin. What was his name again? Um, um, Reynolds. I almost Kevin started. Reynolds. Yeah. They were actually friends. Kevin Costner and Kevin Reynolds were friends. And then they, they had a falling out because of the shit that happened in this movie. They patched things up and did Waterworld again. And they haven't spoken since Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if we ever get to Waterworld, I'll talk about that in trivia and stuff. But yeah, they they were friends. They were like buddies, compadres. And then like they had a big falling out over the editing in this film. Um, they patched things up did Waterworld together, and I don't think they've spoken since. I'm curious. I mean, if this didn't kill their friendship, but that did, I've got to know. Because this was not an easy production either. Between the weather and the winter in England and the fact that Costner was juggling multiple roles, they only really had 10 weeks for pre-production and little time for anything else. It's a wonder they got it done in time. But despite this drama, as you said, this became the second highest grossing film that year behind Judgment Day. And uh, at the time, it was the second best opening for a non-sequel. And it did get some awards. Rickman, uh, I think he was nominated for a few, as you said, Nigel. Uh, The film's theme song. He did get the BAFTA. Yes. Uh, And the film's theme song um, by Brian Adams won the Grammy for Best Song Written for Visual Media. And 2005 American Film Institute nominated this film for AFI's 100 Years of Film Scores. So it sounds great. And not only that, but Kevin Costner and Christian Slater were nominated. And Kevin Costner won a performance award for the Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Actor. That is so unfair. He is not bad in this film. Apparently, the it's definitely not Halle Berry bad in Cat. No, I I, 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 saw that too when I was looking up trivia that he won a raspberry for this, and I'm like, that's not fair. 
He's not bad in this film. There are way worse films. His accent at the beginning of the movie is bad. Yes, it's bad. And you can definitely tell the point. They're like, stop. It's okay. They took some advice from Sean Connery. Sean Connery never spoke in an accent other than his native Scottish accent. Whether he was James Bond or he's Captain Ramsay and Hunt for Red October or he's supposed to be Indiana Jones's father. And it's because Sean Connery said, the audience doesn't care about your accent. They care about your performance. Mm-hmm. Someone should have told Christian Slater that. He also received a nomination for Worst Supporting Actor. I think it has to do with the accents. Which if they listen to this uh, this uh, podcast, we, we probably deserve those as well. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it. I just, I, I feel it's unfair. I, I feel like Kevin Costner gets a bad rap for his performance in this movie. And I think he's fine in this movie. I'll talk about it more after we've watched it. But I've seen way, way worse performances in movies, even movies that also came out in 1991. It also could be to the, his performance in this compared to his other big hit that came out within the same year. Well, I'll admit, yes, he's much better in dances with wolves, but dances with wolves was a much different yeah. movie too. Like it's a, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, JFK and all the other ones. Yeah. It's amazing to consider how many Oscar level roles he's been in, in his career. And just how hard that stuff because of Waterworld. Well, and Postman. Postman and Waterworld, yeah. He has recently seen a little bit of a career renaissance. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Long Gone are the big leading roles from the early 90s like he got. So Yeah, he gets to play Pa Kent now. Yeah. yeah. I've rambled, I've rambled. But the point of this is what we can expect from all this, despite the challenge of the film, you have a competent cast of actors and actresses who know what they're doing. And you got people who, I mean, at least made the most of it. So for all intents and purposes, if you've never heard of this film, you can expect at least a fun journey with some proper actors and actresses giving it their best. But for me... If I have have any expectations, having seen this film, but not having seen it since, <sighs> I can't remember when, not even college. I don't know. I have a bad track record, guys. The past couple films that I had high nostalgia for, because I loved this as a kid, have disappointed me. I mean, I'm so hopeful. I'm still hopeful. It's come on. It's Robin Hood. Even if I don't enjoy the whole film the same way I did Once Upon a Time, I would have to say at least I'll get joy out of, say, um, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman should be good. There are a lot of memorable parts I'm going to look forward to seeing again. And maybe I'll get some cheese love out of this. Maybe it'll just be one of those corny watches. It's so bad, it's good. But that's kind of what I'm expecting. Um, just going back in time once more to see, does this stand the test of time or will it join the pile of nostalgia disappointments? But Josh, what about you? Well, it's, uh, I feel like every time I give expectations, I'm either saying it's been a long time since I've seen this movie or it's like, I watched this movie yesterday. Um, but anywho, I, uh, it's been a long time since I've seen this movie. (laughs) I can, I, I pretty much know it beat for beat, at least chronically in my head i think i know it beat for beat i remember really enjoying it um i really wonder has i i know i've sat down and watched this entire movie in its entirety i have watched this movie in its entirety but um i am curious like to sit down objectively and watch it now because like i said it's like it's probably so long i haven't actually objectively watched it since it came out in the 90s what did you think of it the first time you saw it was it like wow actiony or it's like I mean, what what was your opinions? And how old were you? How long ago was it for you? I honestly don't have any strong memories of watching this movie. Like, I know I watched it, but I don't have any strong memories one way or the other about it. Like, I know I enjoyed it, but I don't think it was like, I need to go out and buy those fun Ewok action figures. <laughs> so I, th- I think I enjoyed it. I just, you know, no strong feelings one way or the other type thing. Mm-hmm. But honestly, tonight, I, I have high expectations. I'm pretty sure I'm going to enjoy this movie. Um, I'm right there with you, too, Tom. I'm hoping that uh, I can see the 90s charm and the 90s cheese. So I guess we will find out, right? And now on to Dan. What are you get, hoping to get out of this film? Well, unlike you two, I have seen this movie recently, although it's been at least 
18 months to two years almost. Cause I know I watched it shortly after trying to watch the 2018 Robin hood and turning that one off. And like, you know what? I'm going to watch a good Robin hood movie. So I watched this one again. Um, I still think it holds up. It's the best Robin hood movie by far still in my honest opinion, like what Tom was saying with the meta, I think the performances in the movie overcome the uh, shortcomings of the film, like the, on again, off again, mostly off again, British accents, the uh, cheesiness of some of the stuff in the movie. But Alan Rickman is just so awesome in his role. And honestly, Kevin Costner is too. They both got to do their own thing with the role. So I really like that. This is also one of Morgan Freeman's earliest big roles. So I'm looking forward to seeing that again. But most of all, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I'm just really looking forward to watching it with you guys. Because I don't think the three of us have ever watched it together. Nope. No, we have Accurate. Yeah. So that tends to be the trend with some of these nostalgic films. I mean, even if we don't like it, at least we, you know, can say we saw it together and all agreed that it was shit. Yeah. Although, Tom, you were saying like some of these movies you've had nostalgic uh, feelings about and they ended up not being good like you know just a couple weeks ago with ghostbusters 2 and all that those had much lower ratings on audi- both audience score and imdb score than like this one does this one's like a 7 out of 10 and a 72 percent. so and I, i'm not saying you're gonna love it but i think i think you'll be pleasantly like okay i don't hate this film and i love the score of this film i think this is one of the best scores not just a, of a Robin Hood film, but of like almost any film, almost any like swashbuckling type of film. This is one of the best scores I've ever heard. You guys need to stop saying swashbuckling. You're giving me post-traumatic swashbuckling syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I'm carrying on. But I think I think I'm gonna like. Well, I know I'm gonna like the film, but I I think even looking at it from a critical eye, there's a few things I'm gonna watch out for tonight. And I'll go over my final thoughts while I'm taking notes while we're watching the film. But um, I'm just looking forward to seeing this film. I still think it's a great film. It's the best Robin Hood movie. It's one of Kevin Costner's. It's it's during that period where Kevin Costner was just lightning in a bottle. Like he was like Dances with Wolves, The Bodyguard, this film, um, uh, uh, Field of Dreams. Like he was just, well, to use a baseball term, knocking it out of the park in almost every film he was in. So, yeah, I see um, what you did there, connecting Field of Dreams. Well, he had two baseball films in this stretch. He had a uh, Bull Durham too, which was really, really good. And he had Field of Dreams, and then Dances with Wolves. This movie, there was another one he did too around this time. For the love of the game. For the love. Well, no, that was after this. For the love oh, of game was yeah. po- is post Waterworld. Kevin Costner, but like I said, this is just it, it, it was during that 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 short two two and a half year stretch where kevin costner was just lightning in a bottle he was just money on everything he was doing and he's this is one of his better performances i i'm actually disgusted he got a razzie for this because he's not that bad so it might have just been a slow year for razzies i mean they had to nominate someone. definitely the british accent thing is kind of a weird thing especially early in the movie when he's still trying to do it and then you can tell the part in the movie where the director's like just stop it's okay. This Robin Hood can be from California. It's fine. You know, and it, yeah. It could, could also just be a testament that that was the quality of movies coming out that year, that they're just like, I guess the worst actor is Kevin Costner. I mean, that's possible. But I don't know, Josh. I mean, getting all these talks about what people expect from these movies and such and such like that. I mean, I wonder what other people have thought and maybe if we knew what they thought about this film, we could understand why you could just say you're looking forward to beating Dan tonight at trivia. Well, I didn't want to, you know, it's okay. Dan has accepted it. He's going to try really hard, but um, I don't know. He's just had the worst of luck the past couple weeks. It's in my head now too. I'm sitting there going, can I at least score a point tonight? All right. So that segue was a segue. So good job. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so here we go. Part three of the uh, Fire Pit Strikes Back trivia quiz. It's not trivia, it's a quiz. But uh, we're going titles again tonight. And uh, we're going to see just what everybody thinks of Robin Hood Pot. pot. Prince of Thieves. Come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess let's go ahead and just get started. Um, Dan, I'm going to go ahead and let you go first. Just be- and take a little bit of pity on you. Oh, thank God. I was worried you wouldn't. The uh, only catch is I've taken pity on the loser every time, and then you've lost. Eh, well. On the first one, that's what happened on the uh, 
second one. So <laughs> maybe you should take pity on the winner this time. Eh? Eh? Throw some uh, softballs at me. If I hadn't already said something, I it's one of those things. I don't want to see my friend lose, but I really want to see Dan lose. Ah, uh, but the audience loves when one of us is suffering. So if I got to take one for the team to get our numbers up, that's okay. Yes. All right. So Dan, to you. Was it Sap Raider 4 said in July of 2003? Almost perfect, dot, dot, dot. But what a huge flaw. It's almost perfect, but what a huge flaw. I'm going to say uh, uh, 7 out of 10. Thompson? I'm going to say 9. Oh, my God. Dan scored a point. Woo! Wait, what? First time in. Three weeks. <laughs> Wait, what yes, was that it? That was a one-star review. That was a one-star? <laughs> oh Holy wow. shit. Okay, that was deceptive little wording. <laughs> yeah, wow. Oh, no. This is not a good sign. All right, so. <laughs> oh, how the turntables. Okay, so, Thompson, to you. By J. Paul Gagan, he said on uh, November 2005... One bonus star for Alan Rickman. One bonus star for Alan Rickman. Shit. Now I'm in my own head. <sighs> Three. Nigel? Two. Tom's going to get shut out tonight. That was another one star review. You son of a <laughs> monkey. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Okay. Come on. Get your head in the game, Tom. Ah. <sighs> Okay, so, Nigel, to you. Okay. This was said by Acedi, A-C-E-D-I, so Ace-D, maybe? I don't know. He said, November 2019, Alan Rickman was an acting god. <laughs> I got a bad feeling it's another one-star review. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say 7 out of 10. Thompson? I'm going to say one star. That was a seven star. Oh my god! Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I can still come back. I can still come back. You gotta get it on the head the next two. Okay, so, Thompson, to you. Path 9766 said in April 2016, typical Costner! Exclamation mark. Two star. Nigel? Typical Costner! Exclamation mark. Four star. And Tom is going to score a point tonight. That was a one star review. No. <laughs> I knew I should have brought in the one star. Damn it, Tom. That's okay. I can tie this. I can tie this and we'll go to the tiebreaker. I'm building suspense. Actually, you can't. Nigel's got four. You can only get a maximum of three. Wait. So. Hey, wait, hey no. I'm wait. back in the saddle, baby. Wait, wait. That was only four <laughs> questions because. It was four, but Nigel has four points at this point. So even if you get the next one on the head, the most you'll get is three points. Oh, son of a bitch. That's right. I, I miscounted. No. I'm got a base hit. I don't care. Well, ask the question anyways. <laughs> All right. So, Nigel, to you. Final question of the evening. Said by Schweitzer 7654 in May of 2003. He said, capital E entertaining dot dot dot. Eight out of ten. Thompson? One. Tom scored one point tonight. <laughs> that was a nine out of ten review. I'm back, baby. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so just for shits and giggles, do you guys want to hear the bonus question? Sure. <laughs> Why not? All right. A Story Weaver said in May of 2003, capital R, rockin', no G, it's just rockin', X, or apostrophe, Robin. I have this one. Yeah, this you would have. you. Ten star. Five. It was a ten star review. Wow. Oh my god. Okay. Okay. I get the bonus. Okay. Well, at least it wasn't a shutout. I got one hit. No. no. I mean, a respectable loss. Absolute mud stomping. I got my ass handed to me. This is embarrassing. Back to true form. We're back to. <laughs> yeah. The the earth has tilted the correct way on its axis now. I feel fine. I am. Uh, I'm really good. Oh, Lord. Kippers and beef. <laughs> yes. That was a good quiz, Josh. Thank you. I, I like uh, mixing them up. 
<laughs> I thought I had your rhythm down. I, I just, I guess I, I don't know the beat. Uh. Because I always change it up. But anywho, um, Tom, you lost. So all I have to say now to you is, Tom, play the music. What ho! And welcome back to another roguish episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspecial host, editor, and forest brigand, Tom! Stand and deliver! Yes, you have stumbled into the forest in which crime knowingly wanders, instigating thievery senselessly! Now, hand over your valuables, lest you find the taxing end of my arrow! Taxing end of my... Wait, you you kidding me? Did I really forget the arrows again? Stand by. Jail? Yes, um, hi. Um, could you check the, um, the porch? I think I left my arrows there again. Yeah, um, oh, okay. Yeah, when you get a chance, could you look? I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of something. Thanks. Cheers. Well, um, guess we can just hang around a bit. But thank you for hanging around with us here at the fire pit. The tax man is lurking all around, so it's good for you to hide here with us while the fire pit strikes back against another evil organization with the Empire Strikes Back. But first we have to wander through this charming Sherwood forest with the roguish of rogues, Robin Hood. But speaking of striking back and hoods that are Robin, Let's see how the team's own strike against tyranny is going. Robin Hood? Yes, they're claiming to have been mugged by Robin Hood. <laughs> well, that sounds like a real cock-up. Uh, <gasps> oh my god! You can tell. Guys, cock-up means messed up. Are they pissed? Oh, you're damn right we are. We do not acknowledge the authority of the usurper, Prince John, you! We shall only speak to those with true authority, and not puppets of the Sheriff of Nottingham. Long live King Richard, the true King of England! Not pissed, just stupid. <sighs> you tourists have me knackered all day. Really? Gross. Josh, what does knackered mean? Horny. Oh. Oh. So, Constable, where were we? You were just about to tell me where you were through this. I was down the street. Josh was out looking for your thugs while the great Robin Hood made his presence known. Oh, Jesus Christ. He was here ten years ago, before your dark reign, and it all went to pot so he knows your ways. Will you guys take this seriously? This guy's just trying to help. Viva la revolution! Pick an accent already. It's all right. Let me just run your names through the system. Just a formality. And, uh, what did you say your name was? Uh, my name's Josh. That idiot is Tom, and that dumbass is Dan. Hi. All right, Josh. Ten years ago. Huh. There appears to be a warrant out for your arrest. What? Threat will be taking you to the sheriff now. I knew it! Revolution! Robin! Robin! Robin, Robin Hood! Robin Hood! Merriman! Robin, 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 Robin Hood! Robin Hood! Robin Hood! Jesus Christ. Ugh. Rebellion! Well, I guess it goes to show, no matter where you go, there you are. And so is someone waiting to take you to prison for tax evasion. So true. But if you want to let us know what sort of movies you're waiting for us to watch, or if you want to get some ads on here for people waiting for the episode to start back up, please email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as what you're emailing about, whether it's for an ad, a correspondence, a message for King Richard warning about threats to the crown, or just to let us know what's on your mind. And shoot it our way. And from there, we'll read it, tie it to an arrow, shoot it into the woods, and never respond. It belongs to the woods now. Let the trees take care of it. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Oh, yo hoi hoi. Are you sure? Did you did you check the? Uh, 
All right, well, thanks for checking. I, I should be back for dinner. Well, I guess we're out of thieving arrows, so I should let you get back to the episode. Thank you for joining, and as always, good luck. I'll never make quota now. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. 800 years ago, Richard the Lionheart, King of England, led the Third Great Crusade to reclaim the Holy Land from the Turks. He failed. I don't remember this play set. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would go over well. A haggard white guy and a chained up black man. Yeah, okay, uh, let's sell this. You can just hear the kids in the commercials saying the lines. <laughs> yeah. Cut off the infidel's hand. Take that for the bread. Watcha! This is English courage. Oh, I'm on fire now. Hey, it's Alan Nickman. <laughs> uh... oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact about this film. This is the quietest Brian Blessed has ever spoken in his entire life. <laughs> See, right after she need me in the balls, that's when I tell her her brother's dead. <laughs> oh, hey, Marion. Hey, Marion. Oh, uh, your brother's dead hacked to pieces in Jerusalem I saw it myself I was going to let you down easy but uh, it's going to take a while for these things to come back down So, <laughs> your few octaves too low there Dan <laughs> it's Alan Richman stop it montage we're building a village with a montage Dude, are they just throwing chickens in the air? Yes. They have wings. They're fine. This is how you dole out chickens. Great. They probably should take them out of the cages before they throw them. Alan Stitchman. Stop. <laughs> Wonder if this will come in handy later. Chekhov's dagger. It's Chekhov's gun. Gosh. Actually, no, I'd be like, it's Chekhov's rifle. And then Tom will correct me saying it's Chekhov's gun. No, it is Chekhov's gun. So I, oh, I said, I've always said a Chekhov's rifle in the past, and you always correct me. So you screwed this up. No, I said Chekhov's gun the first time. You did, and you were right the first time. I was, but then I said, that, but I need to say Chekhov's rifle, and then Tom will correct me. But you didn't say it, so I didn't need to correct you. Therefore, you screwed up. No, I said it right the first time. Just watch the movie, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> This is where Dan's supposed to say, you guys are idiots. You're morons. <laughs> Close enough. Oh, it's no saddle. No saddle. Oh, no. right after she just kicked me in the... Oh, Jesus. There won't be any oh. little Loxleys anytime soon. Oh, God. Oh, there went the merry men. Mm. Alan Lickman. Stop. Ha, ha. No. <laughs> How's that hand doing there, buddy? I gave you a parlor trick. Years from now, you can tell everybody you got the stigmata. I just use it as a sex hole. Gross. <laughs> this is great. Which any fool can eat. Or which the Lord intended. A more divine means of consumption. Let us give praise to our maker by learning about beer. We get it. You drink craft beer. <laughs> 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 Just knocks that down at random. It's like, yeah, fuck this in particular. Nice slide. <laughs> now it's Alan Slickman. Josh, stop. <laughs> you know, Josh, you could probably call it a night. I think Tom and I can handle this without you. <laughs> You'll let me know if people are following us, right? Oh, of course I will. What kind of horse you take me for? Why is the horse talking? Shut up. Speaking of hot... They're using fire arrows. Whoa. Wait, They're not wait. allowed to do that. How come we didn't research fire arrows? Because you put all of our points in stealth. <laughs> flee, flee for your lives. <laughs> at least they're not bomb arrows. Oh, at least they're not using bomb arrows, Josh says. I know this movie's like 25 years old now, but I kind of want a Friar Tuck spinoff. Dan, this movie is 30 years old. 30 years old. Shut up, man. Josh. Shut up. Shut up. I don't know why. I was thinking 95 and not 91. That kid is in his 40s now. Shut up. Ow. 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 <laughs> He's already been hit by a sack of doorknobs. Why are you doing this? Because it's Alan Dickman. <laughs> oh, damn it, Josh. <laughs>
<laughs> These poor bastards who are about to stretch. <laughs> <laughs> who is the best character in this movie and why is it Friar Tuck? I didn't know we had a glory hole. <laughs> <laughs> How am I just now learning about this? Well, waste not, want not. Zip. Ooh, Alan Ooh. Whitman. Boo! Okay, now you definitely are doing final thoughts. Fuck your sleep. <laughs> Fuck your sleep. How do I mute Josh? <laughs> I say any man who has reason why these two should not be joined, let him speak no, or forever hold his peace. I speak. Richard! Dick! 62-year-old Sean Connery playing 37-year-old King Richard. They aged faster back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I do, oh, I do for you. God bless you, Alan Rickman. Right. Alan Commitman. <laughs> Dan, please. Remember the last time he was on base and his internet cut out? That was great. <laughs> that was awesome. he, couldn't, he couldn't talk for like 20 minutes. That was cool. <laughs> No, what's going to be funny is I'm giving you guys gold and Tom's going to edit them all out. And now, back to the episode. All right, so that was Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah, uh, final thoughts. Uh, we're going to get some fun. I'm going to start. I liked it. Uh, it's movie's not perfect. It had some shortcomings, uh, that's for sure. But I think the cast... Mostly overcame that. Uh, Alan Rickman was a lot of fun to watch uh, him absolutely ham it up on screen. He seemed to be enjoying every single minute that he was in character for the Sheriff of Nottingham. And that's amazing. It's always fun when you're seeing the actors are clearly enjoying this, themselves in the roles that they're in. Kevin Costner looked to be having a bit of fun in the role. And that was awesome. But honestly, I just I think the surrounding cast really, really, really helped bring this movie together. And I think that's why the other Robin Hood movies, Men in Tights, notwithstanding, but that's a comedy, so I'll not count it tonight. The other Robin Hood movies from 2010 and 2018 aren't as good because the surrounding cast around the leads wasn't nearly as good or as engaging. Like, uh, Friar Tuck was such a great character uh, in this version. So, Dan, could, could you say that the casting director could Alan pick them? No, 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 no. We talked about this. See, I liked this movie and Josh did everything he could to ruin my enjoyment of this movie. But Josh is not going to do that. You know, we discovered how to mute people today. I'm going to. Oh, my God. I think I'm going to have to use that. Share this information with me, please. Please. <laughs> But back to what I was saying, the surrounding cast was just such um, awesome to watch. I just really enjoyed, like I said, Friar Tuck was amazing. Little John was good, even though I agreed with what Tom said while we were watching the movie that Little John, um, in the mythos of Robin Hood, he's supposed to be Robin Hood's number one. He's his Will Riker to his Captain Picard, his Turk to his JD and all that. But in this movie, he kind of gets downplayed because of Azim's character becomes the number two or number one. So, um, but he was good. I really thought the actor who played little John was really good in this role. So, um, I just, I enjoyed it, but, uh, at the risk of repeating myself and constantly gloating over the cast or going back to yelling at Josh for making terrible Alan Rickman puns all night. Um, <laughs> I will turn things over to Tom. Well, I'm going to have to agree with, uh, a little bit of what you said there, Nigel, Part of the time, it seemed like um, Kevin Costner was having a fun time with the script. And the other half was him really struggling to work with the script. I think that's with a lot of them, too. I see what the writers were trying to do. They were definitely trying to make the movie sound like the classic Errol Flynn Robin Hood films. Like, what ho! Your beauty is a hundred suns smashing into one another. Burr, burr, burr. I've never seen an Errol Flynn Robin Hood, but I'm sure that's a line from there. But you could tell the actors just... It mm, it was pseudo Shakespearean. The only one that could make anything of it was Brian Blessed in the 10 minutes he was in it. But then again, proper trained Shakespearean actor. So 
he's used to making that stuff work. But you could definitely tell the lines that um, him and Rickman's team came in and fixed. I'm not going to lie. This was half a, a fun film. Once they were in Jerusalem and the escape fun, anything action was great. When they tried to take itself seriously is when it was a slog. Like once they got back from Jerusalem and meeting Maid Marian and all that nonsense with the tree. And he's, he's trying to be Errol Flynn. It's like, ugh. But once he started becoming Robin Hood proper, that's when it got fun. You got people getting shot with catapults. Could the movie have just been all of that for two hours? That was that would have been great. Yeah, I, I agree. There was some bullshit that didn't need to be in there, but again, try, took itself too seriously. It when it was fun, it was fun, and that's what saved the film. the The story's predictable, the script was predictable, but it's Robin Hood. You know the story, and it was a fun movie. It really was. I'm not going to complain about this. It's I have some more thoughts to add about the directing, uh, but I think I'm going to let Josh maybe have a word or two about that. So, Josh, what are your thoughts about this rather fun little frolic? Nay, uh, I'm going to preface this. If his words are more puns, he's getting muted and booted off of his call. <laughs> you guys love my puns. no. Josh, we're going to be Alan Strickman about this. Tom, Tom, you're getting a warning now, too. Yep, yep. See, eventually, we're just going to all be throwing all these puns out, and it's just going to be another, the last 10 minutes is just going to be dead air. <laughs> because we will have figured out how to mute one another. Yes. Yes, yes. And we won't unmute. No, I did enjoy this movie. I think Tom is completely right on those certain aspects of the film. Alan Rickman definitely loved his role like you could tell he just hammed it up on screen every friggin opportunity that he got yeah he just just it's one-liners you know, like you at 10 30 you <laughs> at 10 45 bring a friend it's just it's, his lines was hilarious but it was like he had that undertone of being evil without being well being humorous you know it's like you could tell he owned the role he went over he, the top with it he made oh, it he went huge. so over the top with it um, the one issue that I kept having with the movie was the weird zooms that the director kept wanting to do. The only time that I felt like it really made sense was that one scene when he's one on one with the uh, witch lady when she's telling him he's she's his mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I just I, I they did that. They did a weird like camera angle, like where they were kind of like angled down on their foreheads yeah. and kind of like face down. But they really only did that when he was with the witch. Well, no, but the way they do the zoom, they did that zoom multiple times, especially during the fight scenes. And it just annoyed the shit out of me. It's like when I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like every time they did it, it was it was slightly less annoying than the Aquaman zoom. Yeah. Yeah. The steady cam zooms and that. were okay. Yeah. Because this was uh, this was an obvious manual zoom. Where <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the difference between this and the Aquaman zoom is it was weird but at least he showed a little restraint in this one yeah whereas the aquaman one he, once he figured out that feature he just never stopped <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it, th this movie felt like a kid who who realized what those two knobs do on his mom's video camera oh these zoom in and yeah. out sweet yeah um whereas aquaman felt like it was a uh first year student in like film school being like oh oh this is a neat little feature i'm gonna do this everywhere <laughs> and they did yeah i definitely felt like that it felt like that for sure it felt like he was like an art student who was like i'm gonna impress the class by doing this all the time <laughs> like stop but go on josh go on please but um overall the movie was i think it was a little long um i felt like a couple of the scenes especially when they thought that robin hood was dead and then they do the whole like they're going through the uh, rubble trying to find him. And then he walks out into the big epic shadow and the, to his back it was incredibly lame. Um, it's like, OK, we all know he's not dead. And that was just over the top. Yeah, And the Will Scarlet stuff, too. That was unnecessary. Yeah, they could have yeah. easily trimmed this movie down by at least 30 minutes. 
They actually did. We watched the director's or not the director's cut, but the extended edition tonight. Like uh, this, because it had extra scenes with the um, sheriff and uh, the witch lady, and it had a couple of extra scenes in Sh- in Sherwood Forest that aren't actually in the theatrical cut. So actually, this added like fifteen minutes to the movie. Uh, well, if it was fifteen minutes, they could have easily shaved it down by thirty more. Mm-hmm. But you know, okay, I will get, I will forgive it on that regard. Um, I wasn't aware that that was the version that we were watching, but. Overall, it's like I still like the movie. I thought this wardrobe was really good. Like, um, I thought Robin's out or armor was really good. I thought uh, Morgan Freeman nailed it as Azim, and then the wardrobe for Azim was awesome. I, honestly, it just felt like the wardrobe director needed to get a raise, and I hope they did. I just, you know, they probably went off to work on Game of Thrones. I'm sorry if they did. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> One thing I will say, I should have mentioned in final thoughts. This movie made me appreciate how they used to do action movies back then, action and adventure movies. Cause like almost this entire movie is practical effects in sets, sound stages and natural lighting costumes that are, you know, maybe not period specific, but you know, period appropriate. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, it just made me appreciate that, especially the action scenes in this movie, because there's not a bunch of shaky cam, no CG, no blue oh, yeah, screen like backgrounds. Four no, different it, cuts for one sh- one swing of a sword. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it stayed grounded enough, but without being that grim and gritty that all the modern ones seem to keep going with. It wanted to be over the top Errol Flynn, but it didn't have like the bright green tights and the giant feathered caps like it used to be. It just, it yeah, like I said, period appropriate. Not yeah, period. yeah. That's why I said I thought the wardrobe was awesome. Now, like, it's funny as we kept quoting uh, Men in Tights, but, like, I liked the wardrobe in this one. Uh, Men in Tights was obviously there for humor. But, you know, back to the combat and stuff, Yeah, I felt like the combat was a lot more... It was... It felt... Uh, what's the term? Like, more raw, like, less scripted, um, like a lot of modern combat is. Like, I would say uh, this is one of the few things on, you know, circling back to Star Wars being that that's what this journey is about. The one thing uh, I would say, well, one of two things I liked maybe about the sequel trilogy is in episode uh, Force Awakens. The lightsaber fight at the very end. I liked that fight because I always felt it felt raw. Like, these are two untrained people doing their best to not die. Yeah, that's when I... I- I like that too. That find that like mm-hmm. the sword fight at the end between him and the sheriff. Like it wasn't overly choreographed, and there wasn't a bunch of like you know kung fu moves. And, uh, yeah, yeah, he wasn't uh, like it felt raw. That fight felt raw. They wanted and, to kill um, each other. Yeah, they didn't want to just like hit swords in dramatic fashion like Swashbuckler. They wanted to kill one another. Yeah, <laughs> and it also did really look like two people fighting with broadswords. Who, if people who are not sword aficionados or sword people know of, broadswords are heavy. Okay, they're not rapiers. This isn't the, the three musketeers here. They were designed to hit heavy armor. So <laughs> swinging around a broadsword after about a minute or two, your arms are noodles and you can't Yeah, move you're exhausted. Anymore. So you got to <laughs> resort to, you know, punching, fisting, Alan Kickman. Damn it. You were warned, Josh. Where's that button? And that's Where's it. that button? That's it. <laughs> that's tonight's episode. Thank you for joining us, Josh. Ruined the podcast. <laughs> yes, he will not be back next week, ladies and yes. gentlemen. He ruined his chance to watch Flash Gordon. I I uh, am totally going to be back for Flash Gordon. You guys but, can't get rid of me. My name is on the lease. Damn it, his name is on the lease. <laughs> Shit, it is. <laughs> Shit. But uh, anywho, puns aside, the uh, I did like the fight scenes. I did like the uh, costumes. The acting was hit or miss, with the exception of Alan Rickman. No pun there. I, I think, honestly, I liked everybody. The only ones I really had... I think Kevin Costner and uh, God dang it, Christian Slater. I think they got a little campy, but I think that's yeah. that's really all I have for it. Well, it's actually it's a funny thing you should me- bring up Kevin Costner because I I meant to bring this up in my final thoughts, but I forgot for a second. I pulled up the twelfth annual Golden Raspberry Awards just to see who Costner was up against because his performance was inconsistent. But it wasn't raspberry worthy. And this is who he beat out. He beat out Bruce Willis in Hudson Hawk. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone in Oscar, which fuck you, that's a funny ass movie, Razzies. 
Vanilla Ice in Cool as Ice, and Andrew Dice Clay in Dice Rules. Did he win the Golden Raspberry for that? He won the Golden Raspberries for Worst Actor. Wow. All right, fair. Somebody at the Golden Raspberries didn't get a hand job from their girlfriend while they were watching Field of Dreams, and they have held Kevin Costner responsible for that forever because there's no reason – it, I've seen that Vanilla Ice movie, okay? I've seen YouTube productions that with, with better acting and then that movie. How did Kevin Costner win a gold raspberry up against that bullshit? I think I know how, and you may disagree with me or disagree with me. When you look at the pedigree of movies he's done before this, Field of Dreams and all that. Yeah, I forget. Did he win an Oscar for Field of Dreams? Or not Field of Dreams, Dance with Wolves? I know Dance with Wolves won a, bu- won a bunch of Oscars. I forget if he won the Oscar for acting on that one. Yeah, I don't know if he did, but I know Dance with Wolves won a bunch of Oscars that year. It did win Best Picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But when you had those movies before you, and then you show up in Robin Hood going, Oi, I, Robin of Loxley, I'm here to save Jerusalem. They look at you and go, we know you can do better. He's the A-plus student that just didn't even turn in the homework or he just like, it's clear that he didn't really do the homework. Yeah. Vanilla ice. We expected a bad acting out of a rapper turned actor. So yeah, that is about what we expected. But then you get this Kevin Costner, who's known for amazing movies like this, this, and this, you filled the dreams dances with wolves. And then he comes out with this. The quality has significantly dropped. We are talking about, you know, the curve is, or the uh, gap is significant to the point where it's that bad. Oh, Kevin, we thought so much better of you. <sighs> tisk tisk. And that's a shame because Kevin Costner, like I said, he had fun. And again, maybe it's also his writing people too. It's like the comedy scenes where, especially the hand, like he did that whole stupid things like, buy this blood oath, I will avenge you. And they kept doing things to that hand that he cut, like slamming into the door or people hitting it. And the way he sold it was so funny. Dude, I never noticed that until you pointed it out. That was hilarious. Tonight when I was watching it, I was head cannoning that that's why in the movie he goes from being a sword fighter to an archer, even though they don't establish at any point in time, like he was an archer in the Crusades or he was an arch. Like the 2010 version did. The 20, that's, that's why he was so good with bow and arrow in the 2010 version. They, 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 they mentioned that he was an archer in the Crusades, but like they don't say that at all in this movie. But when they, they go start building Sherwood Forest and the Merry Man and the Band of Outlaws and all that, he becomes this expert archer. I was headcanning was he, he became an archer because his hand fucking hurt by holding a sword now because he got smashed and cut and all that. So he just became an archer. You know what? That makes sense. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, my God. Yeah, because they definitely played out that he was a good archer, though. So it's like he didn't just start. No, but they don't do anything in the. Like, yeah, they don't definitely lead up to him being an archer. Yeah, because when, like, when mm-hmm. he's escaping Jerusalem, he never uses a bow and arrow once to escape Jerusalem. No. He uses a crossbow to take out the sheriff's men when they ambush or when he, he confronts them about chasing that boy up the tree. Um, but he doesn't actually use a bow and arrow until right before the montage of them building Sherwood Forest or the the, uh, the hideout. Like the first time he uses a bow and arrow is when he shoots Will Scarlet right through the hand, which that's an incredibly hard shot to make. He did it so quickly. He, I mean, he spun around and within seconds was firing an arrow. Like that comes with training. Like an expert archer can do that. So he just becomes this mm. great archer. So I'm like, he became an archer because his hand hurt. <laughs> yeah. like, that's why. And probably why he had so much trouble trying to fight the sheriff at the end too. It's like his, his fighting hands fucked up. He's doing his best just to keep up with a guy. He probably could have beat earlier on. Yeah. The weird things you pick up on after the movie, it's like, huh, maybe this movie's a little more clever than we give it credit for. And I like to think that somewhere far away, somebody's uh, who wrote one of the writers of this movie somehow listens to this uh, episode and he's like, that's it. Exactly what I meant. Nobody got that. Nobody fucking got that. We got it, sir. And we tip our hat to you. I'm I'm doing the hat hat tipping motion. I don't even know why. Yeah, I was doing the hat tipping motion too, but. Oh, God. My lady. <laughs> but, no, I, like I said, uh, the movie's got some flaws, but I overall had a really fun time watching it. It's still one of my favorite movies of all time. Flaws aside, I don't know. It's one of those things. I love it despite its flaws. You're allowed to say that. I said I liked Die Hard too. 
So you are allowed to like a movie to, despite its flaws. Yeah, like I said, I, I do. I mean... Eh. Die Hard 2 is flaws with bits of a decent movie inside of it. This one's got a decent movie with a few flaws. Here yeah, this was definitely a good movie overall. Like, I remember um, our Galaxy Quest episode, we talked about how... Um, Galaxy Quest was a good movie, but it was lacking that one thing that made it great. Mm -hmm, I feel like mm -hmm. this has more ingredients to make it great, but it's also got a lot more mediocre ingredients that just keeps it from being great, you know? It's got the ingredients necessary to make a normal film great, but the bottom level shit, it's like they used a shit flower for something. I can see why this movie was only number one for two weeks, but I can also see why it made so much money. It's like one of those movies where like you do want to rewatch it, but you don't want to rewatch it all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I can yeah, see yeah, why yeah. it was, it was in theaters for so many months and it made a ton of money. I think we mentioned in the rundown, it made like $325 million on a budget of 45. That's some good scratch, but it was only number one for like two weeks. So of course, and that's almost all movies nowadays, but yeah, for that time frame, it's like there and gone, but ooh, yeah, what an impact it made. Yeah. Again, I'm glad we watched this. This was a not a good movie, but a fun movie. That's it's a great laundry folding film. Yeah, good. yeah, that's a that's that's a good one. Yeah, but I think I've hit all my notes and then some. Team, I mean, directing fine, writing. Yeah, yeah 50, you know, 50. I will finally say that uh, it was a shame that uh, Alan Rickman got sick at the very end of this uh, filming of this film. Don't. Don't, don't you dare, Josh. He was Alan Sickman. <laughs> oh, and that's it for tonight's episode. I have a headache. Shoot, you have outro, Josh. Darn it. <laughs> ah. And that's it for tonight's episode. The guys absolutely love my puns. No, no. Yes, yes, you do. Um, as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are produced and sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please, please like and subscribe on whatever medium of choice as it really helps out the podcast, and we really do appreciate it. So thank you, if you already have. Um, and be sure to join us on our Discord channel as well to let Josh know how much how of a amazing. monster he has been. An amazing monster he has been through this whole movie experience. A link to the Discord channel is in the episode's description and on our site at firepick.podbean.com. There you'll get notifications of new episodes. And even better, give Josh what for for bringing puns into what's supposed to be a classy podcast. Mm. And if you want to send us a message old school style, at least as old school as emails go, um, just email us. The emails mentioned at this interspersal segment in the back there. And if you want, make the header, make Josh no more puns. No more puns from Josh. That would be great. We would love you forever if you did that. Please email us to make him stop. Um, this was painful. Not the movie. The movie was fine. Josh's puns were painful. You are going to be sadly disappointed when everybody loves the puns. Hashtag Josh puns everything. Come on, let's start it. Yeah, I think um, I think our audience is a little more classy than that, Josh. We we uh we engender a more sophisticated crowd. Highbrow, if you will. They will truly rebuke you for your punishment. Oh, well, yeah. um, I think Tyrick Thorne will enjoy my puns. So uh, that's my first shout out, by the way. So uh, <laughs> shout out to Tyrick Thorne for being a loyal listener. I mean, I enjoy uh, chatting with you and uh, all the other people on our Discord channel, Danielle and everybody else who's on our Discord that does partake. So thank you guys. Um, Rob is also there. Uh, who am I missing? Nick. I said, I'm, I'm going to call out, uh, yeah, Nick, Tucker. It's like, I'm like, I'm going to call out our Discord guys. And then I just blank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you guys for partaking on conversation and uh, being a part of the Discord. So shout out to you guys. And I'd like to shout out to our Facebook followers out there. Many more coming in. I apologize if this is your first episode that you're joining in. I don't. Normally, we're better than this. This is peak fire pit. It's all downhill from here. I apologize. <laughs> but to you, layman, 
Humphrey and Ledbetter, thank you for joining, abstaining from your full names for privacy purposes and for everyone else. Thank you for joining us and keeping these fire pit fires burning. And I'd like to give a shout out to once again, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. And also a special shout out to my family for putting up with me recording these on Saturday nights and a special shout out to Josh's puns for turning my headache into a full blown migraine. You're welcome. Josh's puns secure for a good time. (laughs) (laughs) Is that what we're calling them now? It seems appropriate. But uh, speaking of appropriate, what what movie are we flying to next team? Oh, wow. Well, we mentioned it in our final thoughts. At least I think I did. But we are following the amazing Brian Blessed as he screams at the top of his lungs. To me, my Hawkman! In the great flick, Flash Gordon. Ah, what a man to lead us to a flick such as this. Yes, cult classic that it is. Sounds kind of awesome. Pity that Alan Rickman's not in it. Yes, he could not be in this flick, man. I don't, I don't know what you guys are getting at, but uh, anywho, I've been Josh. I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. Hey, Robin! Yeah, John? I was wondering, you know this whole Robin from the rich and give it to the poor thing? Yeah, John, what about it? What's it all about? Are we making some kind of political statement? Are we rebelling against the tyrannical fascist reign of Prince John? Are we stating that the people of England will not recognize his mad reign in the absence of his brother, the true king? Well, I... And what happens when the rich become poor and the poor become rich? Is it all some kind of vicious cycle? I don't know, John. I'm just winging it. Oh! Right, carry on! Righto! So what are they going on about? I have no idea. They lost the plot about two hours ago. Oh. Josh, Josh, what does that mean? It means you're stupid. Um, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that yeah, that makes sense. Righto! Righto! <laughs> that was good. <laughs>